I'm in Brazil exploring one of the great wetland treasures, but this is not the Amazon. It's the Pantanal, and it's an ecological paradise. I'm Art Wolf. This is Travels to the Edge. Pantanal is a landlocked river delta that experiences annual cycles of flooding and drought. Lying in the center of the South American continent, the Pantanal stretches south of the Amazon basin and east of the Andes, crossing the borders of eastern Bolivia and Paraguay into west central Brazil. I'm traveling with Russ Mittemeyer, one of the world's leading conservationists and an expert on this pristine and biologically rich ecosystem. The Pantanal is the world's largest wetland. It's an incredible area that is something on the order of 20 times the size of our Everglades, which is our most famous wetland. And it has enormous concentrations of wildlife, densities of some of the most important flagship species in the South American continent. So this is a giant floodplain. Mm -hmm. And does it flood, in fact? It does, in fact, flood every year. And that's one of the interesting things about the Pantanal is the dynamic of the water. At certain times of year, parts of the Pantanal are entirely underwater, like a gigantic lake. And the animals have to move into the slightly higher areas to avoid the, uh, avoid the water. But many of them, like the capybaras, for example, are perfectly adapted to an aquatic system. I'm getting a great shot of two hyacinth macaws just playing on a branch. It's so nice when the two are together, they just are interacting. I really like those kind of shots where two animals are really showing some sort of affection or connection. And of course, macaws are birds that have very strong pair bonds. Very often they mate for life, and this preening behavior is really part of maintaining that pair bond. This is a really incredible uh, group of four species of macaws that are entirely blue. This one, the hyacinth macaw, is 5,000 or so individuals remaining, which really isn't very much. And the majority of those are found here in the Pantanal. It's a bit deceiving, though, when you see them so common here in these uh, fazendas in the southern part of the Pantanal, you don't really appreciate the fact that this is a species that is really endangered and is extremely hard to find anywhere else outside the Pantanal. The reason they're going extinct in the wild is they're being collected. Wildlife trade, absolutely. They're worth thousands, tens of thousands of dollars per animal. And so there's a huge incentive to capture them and sell them illegally. This is their major stronghold, and if they're going to survive into the future, this is where it's going to be. These are chestnut-eared arasaris, and it's, uh, it's a small toucan, basically. The toucans and the arasari is my second favorite group of birds after the, the parrots and the macaws here in South America. Oh, these guys so, are really so colorful neat. with that yellow and that red or rust color. They are cool birds. This is definitely my favorite of the toucans. It's so striking. Yeah, this is the, uh, the, the classic uh, Fruit Loops uh, toucan. This is uh, Ramphastus toco, the toco 
toucan, which is the, the largest of all the toucans. Spectacular, huge beak, and that uh, blue eye ring, deep black eye. It's really, really an impressive creature. It looks almost top heavy. The bill is so large, it looks like he's almost gonna fall over. The whole beak and the eyes standing out through that tangle of branches, and it's really actually a beautiful shot. If you wanted to design a spectacular looking species, this is, uh, this is the kind of thing that you would come up with. Absolutely. This is one of these rare places where human activities and wildlife are able to coexist very, very effectively. And about 95% of the land here is in large land holdings, these fazendas, these big farms or ranches where cattle are raised at a fairly low density and they're able to coexist very effectively with almost all of the wildlife. Here you still have cowboys herding cattle, moving them through this landscape the way they did 100, 150 years ago in the American West. It feels very much like the Old West with palm trees. Cowboy is very much a throwback to the old west of North America. And this is quite a traditional scene that's been unfolding for over a hundred years. And just to get this is really a beautiful moment. It's very interesting that cattle are watching us. This is really quite striking with these thousand head of cattle coming through this water. It's amazing. What a scene. That was nice. What a nice moment. I agree. Absolutely fantastic. It's roundup time on these big cattle ranches. I'm now trying to get a sense of the cowboy culture. This cowboy is rounding up these cattle. They're backlit and covered in dust, and suddenly it becomes a painting. Low-density cattle ranching is the number one industry here, and hard-working Pantanero cowboys are the backbone of this economy. As a long day comes to a close, these Pantaneros make camp and get ready to enjoy some well-deserved downtime. moment in the early morning mist as these Pantaneros get ready for their journey. This is just like the Old West with these grand cattle drives and it's happening still here in the Pantanel. The low angle of light early in the morning where the Pantaneros are breaking camp and they're rounding up the cattle and they're moving on for another journey across the Pantanel. 
And the rising mist, the angle of the light, it's like looking into multiple paintings. And these are the moments when I can't believe how lucky I am to have been here. These caiman are one of the most emblematic and prehistoric animals of the Pantanal. Their teeth grow so long they come up through their snout. It's a really nice situation with wild animals, given the fact that they're unpredictable and they have sharp teeth, it makes me a little bit apprehensive, but I'm gonna to try to slowly maneuver around and get some very provocative and very interesting shots. Okay, that's actually a nice shot. This is right in their face, and all I got is a shot of teeth and really interested caiman. Not only predators that exist in abundance in the Pantanal, birds are especially diverse and they thrive here. The challenge of photographing kingfishers is maneuvering the boat in a current, trying to get up close to what is normally a pretty jittery and erotic little bird. Oh, so beautiful. Wow, that beak is pretty impressive. That's what's so classic about these kingfishers is their beaks are enormous. I love it when their little tail cocks up at an angle. They open their beak and they chatter. That is a perfect kingfisher moment. Just got him before he flew. I'm so happy. That was really nice. Let's go up here one more time. I love following an animal like this in its environment and trying to get that shot. This little river otter is very smart and very elusive. If we go down river, it goes up. If we go right, it goes left. Spending three hours on this river, there he is. I'm willing it to come out on this log. Oh, he's back up river. There's either two river otters or this one is really fast. Now he's come out of the water. He's chomping on a fish. 
And where is he? A hundred yards down the river. We lose again. This caiman's come in for a really close view. And just the way the light is playing on its head and reflecting in the water, there's a really nice mirror image. Driving down the roads with a giant spotlight, you can pick up so many animals. Certain animals like owls and giant potus, cats certainly, have highly reflective eyes. It's really like an Easter egg hunt. You're out there hoping to see something looking back at you out of the blackness. Look at that, Russ. Oh, yeah. Great potu, what, a, what an amazing bird. Using this powerful spotlight to illuminate the subject works really well. Otherwise, I'd have a flash here that only goes out about 30 feet. Clearly, that potu is about 50 or 60 feet away. It's so bizarre looking. It's a very cool bird. Wow. I've got a giant anteater over here about 15 feet away. It's one of the most iconic animals of the Pantanal. They're so bizarre. These animals hang out during the day in the quiet refines of the forest, but at night they come out into this open grassland that is so characteristic of the Pantanal. They eat 30,000 ants a day, which is an amazing amount, but given the size of the animal, they really need that quantity to survive. I'm photographing a paraki, which is a nightjar. It's a nighttime bird. It's got really beautiful eyes, but more importantly, a very camouflaged set of feathers. They rely on their camouflage to remain hidden. So as long as this bird thinks that I can't see it, it's going to stay in place. I'm going to quickly get a shot here, because as soon as we take the spotlight away, it's gone. It will take off. a little sound, he keeps looking. That's it, that's it. This looks like a great horned owl, but I don't believe it is. No, no, it looks like uh, like the striped owl. Well, you have good luck with owls. You've seen a bunch of them already on this. Trip. Oh, I just it's love them. Right I mean, yeah, their eyes animals. are so big, and look at the rust color on that one. There's something in here because we saw the eye shine. Oh, look. It's an ocelot. It's an ocelot. That is unbelievable. We've got an ocelot right here. They are so difficult to see in the wild. Wow, he is so pretty. Look at how he's just wanting to come out, but he's so tentative. Oh, There's a number of spotted cats here in South America, and this is the second largest after the jaguar, and it's just a stunningly beautiful animal. That was fleeting, but beautiful. Getting shots of wildlife takes patience and determination. So I'm back to flush out that wily otter. Oh, he's got, he's got a fish. I'm getting stellar shots of a really reclusive little otter munching on a fish. 
It's great light because the sun is right at my back and it's a very difficult shot, but there's a gap through these logs. Look at his two little paws around that fish. I mean, he's a happy camper right now. What a call. I've never heard anything quite like that. It. They're so noisy. This is the, the giant otter, really the great flagship species of the Pantanal and one of the great animals of South America. In many of the Spanish-speaking countries, they call it uh, Lobo de Rio, the wolf of the river. This is amazing. This These is guys are so big. And they're so noisy. What's the weight of these guys? Boy, these guys will get up around 70 pounds. 70 and pounds. Six to seven feet long. They're really very, very big animal when you see them stretched out on land. And, and they're just incredibly agile and most efficient fishermen you could ever imagine. It's like a aquatic leopard or a puma. He's looking right at us. This is really nice. It's just incredible. We're obviously at a distance that they feel comfortable. Uh, you know, otters epitomize play behavior as far as I'm concerned. This is beautiful right now. I love floating down the river and just having things pass by gently. This is a great time of day. Pantanal is about as close to a paradise as you can find. Well, certainly this evening on this river. Uh, it's just gorgeous. I would not debate that. Capybara, caimans, and birds flying to their roosting sites. This is the kind of place where you really can achieve conservation objectives, too, at a, at a significant scale. I'd love to bring a lot of people that live in the city mm -hmm. that have never gone out into a wilderness area, plunk them down, let them see the sheer amount of wildlife here, mm -hmm. and you'd have a conservationist forever. The Baja Peninsula can strike you as a barren, empty landscape. Just cactus, sand, and heat. But as your eye adjusts, the unexpected comes into focus. I'm Art Wolf. This is Travels to the Edge. Whenever I have a chance to get in a small plane and get above the land, I jump on that. It's such a great way to get a sense of the land, and it is also a great way of photographing the land. Bounded by the Sea of Cortez on the east and the Pacific Ocean on the west, the Baja Peninsula is a thousand miles of arid landscape. This is where the desert meets the sea. The waters of the sun-drenched Sea of Cortez, or Gulf of California, are a primary breeding and feeding habitat for many resident and migratory species. I'm exploring the region with my friend Patricio Robles Hill, one of Mexico's leading conservation photographers. We're starting our journey here on Santa Catalina Island. Patricia, this is beautiful. But what makes this place so unique? Just look at it. This is, for me, it's the ocean, 
and here, the, the Sonora Desert, is the combination of the two is what makes this environment, the Gulf of California, so special. Everybody hears about desert and they think that it's only sand. This is really a very diverse environment. You see life everywhere. This place in the Gulf has over 100 islands. Are they all like this? I mean, we're not seeing development here. Well, they are very pristine. They are, of course, reserves. The vegetation is what makes them special. Mexico is uh, one of those mega diversity countries. We have rainforests, we have pine oak forest, and we have deserts. But I think the Gulf of California and the islands by itself is what it makes very unique. There's nowhere else in the world that uh, there's a place like this. It's what you could say Mexico is different here. The most famous cactus on this island is the barrel cactus. It grows larger here than anywhere else in Mexico. What I'm doing with this is shooting with a wide angle, which allows me to incorporate the mountains in the distance and the beautiful waters beyond. I got this beautiful cardon cactus perched on the edge of a cliff. I love shooting multiple angles of a single subject like this. And since I've worked so hard to get up here, you can bet I'm not gonna leave with just one composition. These are the shots I love to find and bring back. The sun is almost setting beyond the distant mountains on the Baja Peninsula, and all these cactuses are really picking up that oblique angle of the sun, and they're so textured that they become three-dimensional. This is the magic hour. Just a little bit of the sun will eliminate the lens flare and allow me to get a good shot. last seconds of the light, it really changes fast when the sun is on the margin, and this is beautiful. After working all day long in the intense heat of the desert, I find it really satisfying to sit back in the cool breeze, reviewing the work that I've shot all day. Look at this. Hundreds of dolphins are racing towards their boat. They're coming literally to meet the boat. Oh, I'm so excited. This is what it's all about. Come on, guys. Come and get your photos. They're everywhere. Dolphins everywhere. I love this. This is exciting. They understand there's a TV show being done, and they just obviously want to be stars of the show. Occasionally, one will just completely jump out of the water. Right when they come out of the water, you can see their eyes, their head. It's almost like it's all choreographed. It's like a water ballet right now. I could do this literally all day long. Laguna Ojo de Liebre, a rich and expansive wetland on the Pacific side of the peninsula, is a sanctuary for thousands of seabirds. 
This is beautiful. There's several thousand sandpipers just flying in unison. shot here with an osprey that's got a nest out in the open. As this adult is flying around, I'm just waiting for that one moment, like now. That's so dynamic when it spreads out its big long wings and just hovers in the air for a brief moment. sea lions and they're saying art, 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 art. These are fertile waters and it's here that we're hoping to find gray whales on the final leg of their epic migration. The longest of any mammal on the planet. They come all the way down the coast from Alaska and they come into these bays to give birth to mate. It is a huge nursery in these protected lagoons on the west coast of Baja. When gray whales are born, they're 15 feet long. They weigh up to 1,500 pounds, and they can swim virtually at birth. Nobody really understands completely why they choose these lagoons. Uh, a lot of speculation is that the salinity of the water is very high and so the babies can bob easier upon birth. Now this is a pretty big whale here. It knows we're here, it can hear the engine, and it's up to the whale whether it comes to us or not. There's one coming right under our boat. Yeah, he's right there, look at that. Come up and look at us. And he did. Oh, this one's coming our way. That's a good sign. He's coming straight at us. There is a 30-ton animal heading our way. He's coming up. Oh, he's a baby. Oh. Hey, this is a whale. <laughs> oh, yes. That was a close encounter. There's a lot of whales right here. We're literally surrounded now by gray whales. And it's amazing to me that at one point, early in the last century, they were hunted to near extinction. And now they've come back in great numbers, and they're positively friendly. You know, Art, these whales, the whalers used to call them the devil fish. Why? Because they hunt the babies just to attract the mother, and the mother will come furiously and, and actually attack the boat at that time. And now I think it's very nice how with so many years of conservation and protection now they are really really friendly and they come and get so close they want to be touched the only thing you cannot touch is the eye and the blowhole otherwise your our germs could infect it yeah Here. oh look at this one there's a baby it's right below us <laughs> Okay, this is cool. I like this. Oh, coming to the surface. Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Here. Oh. Here. Hey, oh, it's right there. He's rubbing. Look at that. I touched the whale. I touched the whale.
was one of the best encounters of my life. Woo! Yeah! -ho! We're heading inland now towards the isolated Sierra de San Francisco mountain range. It's a tough and sometimes bizarre landscape. As I'm traveling through these really remote San Francisco mountains, these really interesting trees caught my eye. These are known as cereal trees or bujum trees. They're really shaped by the relentless winds that often come in off the Pacific Ocean. As a result, they almost look like they were designed by Dr. Seuss. These shots are really trying to convey a sense of this place, this really rugged, wild mountain range here in the Baja, but in a fun way. The remote canyons of the Sierra San Francisco guard Baja's most important rock paintings. Sites are difficult to reach and guides are essential. Hola. 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 After saddling up, we begin the trek down into San Pablo Canyon and our quest to find these ancient cave paintings. It's amazing how sure-footed these mules are on this really steep, rocky terrain. This has been a long ride down this steep canyon. I'm one tired cowboy. I've spent most of the day on a mule. What I'm trying to do now is just take some wide angles to really convey a very different sense of place. As I walk along the creek in the bottom of this canyon, I'm just looking for a couple last minute shots. Maybe it's a reflection of the wall in the stream. It could be just details in this creek. I'm just on a mission, looking for that last great shot. As morning breaks, Patricio and I head off to find the cave paintings. On the way, I'm pleasantly surprised to come across Zantu's hummingbirds bathing in a canyon spring. I'm getting shots of the hovering Xanthus, but there's also another hummingbird, which I'm not really sure could be a Lucifer. And it's just coming in right now. They just look, they hover, and then they land, and they take a bath. A little bit more in front of us are the cave paintings. On the walls ahead? Yes, yes. That is beautiful. This is one of the most impressive panels I've ever seen. The sheer size of this the vibrance of the color, and the number of human figures, and they all kind of overlap. It's very exquisite. Let's go up and look closer. This is spectacular. How on earth did they ever paint way up there? This is like traveling back in time to ancient America.
power of the art. That's what connects me to this place. And knowing that a human, and we don't even know when, that human painted that red line or that foot or that animal, it instantly connects you to this place. You are an artist. You started as a painter, and also I, I did the same thing. The guys who painted it were artists, and they were the shamans, they were the druids in, in their times. In some way, Art, you and I, as a conservation photographers, I think we are the new shamans, because we photograph what is at risk, all the wildlife, the animals, the places that are really threatened, and we show to society this is what needs to be taken care of for our own survival. Further north is the Catavina Desert, one of my favorite places to isolate the essential elements of this landscape. I'm getting a really subtle image of the desert right now. A very, very quiet and yet emblematic shot of the desert right before dawn. And now I'm off and running, and I'm just trying to get a series of shots before the light actually hits. The sun will be here within a minute. Now I'm looking for a subject for that. Light's coming up here. Not it. This is really nice right up here. It's beautiful. I'm gonna walk around this rock and try to play with the different angles and see how many abstract compositions I can get out of a single rock. In fact, right from here, this is rather interesting because I can see the top of a cardon cactus right through the hole in this rock. The Catavina is a great place to photograph but rarely do I walk through an environment and immediately find an interesting shot. Often, I'm really scouting locations that I will later return to and frame when the light gets great. Anybody that knows me as a photographer really understands that I love to work with the elements of design. And in this simple shot, I've got patterns, line, and texture. Beautiful light, great depth, simple shot. This is really a lot of fun to play with wide angles and rounded rocks and curved Bujun trees. It's very, very different than photographing wildlife. You've got holes in rocks and twisted trees and wow, that's pretty interesting too. Wondering if I got in this rock and shot out what it would look like. I'm going in the rock. Goodbye. It's just a beautiful framing using this hollowed out granite rock as my frame. It's really cool. I like nothing more than putting my mind in a relaxed state and just simply responding to the textures and the changing light as the sun is moving across the sky, suddenly a simple rock becomes a sculptured element. There's something to be said about working with a minimalist landscape. 
that you can come away with some of the most striking compositions. The more I am engaged and really work a subject, the more I discover. I'm really working hard for this Bujum tree because it's got such interesting angles. It's, it's like a ballet dancer with these graceful twists and curves. And the more I walk around it, the more it reveals itself. And as the light drops, everything becomes magical. In this spare environment, beauty reveals itself with each passing moment. And the more you look, the more you see. I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge.